Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? Hello, Ben. What's up, Tom? What do you think of the new setup? It it, it changes every single time <laughs> I come in here. I can't lock the the old setup in my head. I know. And it, and it's on to some. That's something interesting about Tom, though. You're currently you're consistently changing things. You're always changing. I don't like change. Tom loves change. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty accurate. Yes. Yeah, like, I mean, the bottom line is, is that I, I, you know, I've always wanted to have the studio set up a certain way. And, you know, that's basically what I've been trying to do. And so I've been changing things around like, you know, you, you would understand like right now, see these boom arms are blocking your face, and I don't like it. <laughs> so come Monday, I'll come in. There'll be a new microphone. Here we go. How's that? Look at that. Oh, I can see cool. your beautiful mug. Awesome. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one it is that you choose to use. Thank you. And uh, also, thank you for watching on YouTube. Uh, ben and I have been doing YouTube for a while now, and I think that um, you know, it's working out well. I have fun doing it. I say it all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and ultimately what we're trying to do is help you turn your mess into your message. And if you want to reach out to us, you could always email us Tom at real recovery talk.com and Ben at real recovery talk.com. Right, Ben? Yes, that is correct. What's new in your world? Same old, same old. Uh, uh, life's about to get super busy. It already is, but Weston's starting up tackle football again. So, oh no, I'm getting back to the practice three nights a week and games all day Saturday. It's it's a huge commitment, especially tackle because there's so much organization that goes into it. As far as like coaches building a team, are you? I'm coaching? not coaching. Not this year. Oh, that's good. Yeah, was, while I got this bodybuilding thing going going on. Which How's I'm that going? 17 weeks out. 17 weeks. Yep. Started this the last week of August of last year. And so technically September, I guess you could say. I did the whole month of September, and uh, finally it'll be over a year later. I'm ready to do this. It's funny you say 17 weeks, and it sounds like, oh, that's just, you know. But it's, that's uh, what, four months away. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I guess so, but I guess compared to what I've been doing, it's like, eh. Well, I tell you what, I've seen a lot of commitment on your end uh, throughout this whole process, and it's pretty fascinating uh, to see, you know, everything that you've had to go through over the past year in order to make this work. Yeah. How do you feel overall? Right now, good. Before. The prior phase of this, I was eating so much food. I was constantly uncomfortable. Bodybuilding's not healthy. I'll throw that out there. Right. A lot of people look at it like, oh, you're in, in great shape. You go to the gym all the time, this, that, the other. But it is taking it to an extreme. It's not something that I believe you can stick to for an entire lifetime without having some sort of health consequences. Right. You know, you got to be aware of that. It's It's not healthy to eat the amount of food that you have to eat to put on muscle that bodybuilders put on. And I'm at like the low end of the extreme of what people do. Like people that do it as a professional living. They're eating 10,000 calories a day. Yeah, a and they it ruins their digestive tract. They have all kinds of intestinal problems, high blood pressure, this, that, the other. It, it's not a healthy thing to do. You're pushing your body to, to an extreme. Your, the human body is not meant to have that much muscle and that low a body fat. Right. Because what body fat percentage will you be at when you're on stage? Like 4%? I don't know the answer to that, but I would guess so. Yeah. I mean, I would think 6 or less. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I've never worked with a coach before, so I was at 6% the first time I did it in 2009, according to the little handheld. The end body? Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you foresee yourself after this is all done? Do you foresee yourself continuing or? It depends how well I do as far as placing. If I place well at this and 
you you don't know until you see the final product. The day of the show with being dehydrated, all that stuff. Um, but if I do well and Billy, my coach, says to me, hey, you could possibly you should possibly do like a national qualifier and get what's called your pro card. If he has confidence that that I could possibly get a pro card, that might be something to go for. Otherwise, I'll probably call it and just say because I wanted to do it initially for the experience. But if I get a pro card, then you get the opportunity to compete in a professional show. And at my age, man, we're almost 40, you and I. Yeah. To be able, you know, I (coughs) kind of throw it out there. I look back at my life, at least. I don't know if you do, but I really had some potential to, for instance, maybe play football. At least, like, get a college scholarship, something along those lines. I was fast when I was young, real fast. And, you know, I blew that all doing alcohol and drugs. I always wanted to join the military. Didn't do that because of alcohol and drugs, you know? So kind of, I kind of look at it like I said I wanted to do this to say that I did it, not look back and say shoulda, woulda, coulda, because I've always had a passion for weightlifting, bodybuilding ever since I was in high school, middle school, actually. And, you know, if I'm hit 40 years old and, have a chance at being a professional at something, some sort of professional athlete, that'd be cool. It's not like make or break for me, not something I have to accomplish, but yeah. if the opportunity's there, I would take it. Well, I'm selfishly going to say, I hope you don't place so you can be off this crazy, <laughs> crazy thing. So we could actually go get lunch and stuff together. Again. You know what I'll start doing? I'll start running again. I'm not allowed to run right now and, I believe in being overall, if I wasn't doing this competitive for a competitive reason, I'm more about being healthy all around, you know, having good cardio, a healthy heart, still being strong in the gym. Right. But, you know, I don't know that I could run a mile like I was prior to starting the. I think I did a mile and what was the last one I did? I think it was. Was it seven and a half or six and a half? I six remember I was half. telling you. It was six, it was and, a six and a half. Yeah. yeah. So I definitely, I, I doubt I could even run a mile now. Uh, you could run one. It would just probably take you 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and that's not healthy, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, listen, some people can't even tie their shoes. Yeah. So it's all, all perspective, I suppose. Um, well, I came across an interesting article. Did you? Yeah, that I wanted to bring up. And um, I think we could get a, a decent discussion out of this. And the, the article was actually uh, in Forbes magazine. And it was written in June. Um, June 27th. So it's in Forbes magazine. And the title is... Why Gen Z is drinking less and what that means for the alcohol industry. So I dove into this a little bit and um, it's pretty interesting to see that and and they've estimated roughly that um, Gen Z is consuming about 20% less alcohol than say us Mm -hmm. like millennials and whatever comes before us. You know what I'm saying? So I, I was I, I was reading and I'm not obviously going to read the article, but uh, I did I did I did read the article, <clears throat> and it was pretty intriguing in a, in a way. Not intriguing in the sense of like um, business security, but intriguing in the sense of people are getting sober, or not even the fact that they're getting sober. They're just choosing to not drink alcohol, which I think is pretty cool. And I say not intriguing in the business sense, because obviously we make a living with people getting sober. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be drug addicts and alcoholics. I'm I'm speaking tongue in cheek there. Um, But the the nature of the article was, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially younger, you know, in their early 20s, maybe late teens, early 20s, mid 20s have uh, adopted more of a role on health and wellness overall speaking. And obviously in, in that, if you adopt that sort of mindset, 
you're not consuming alcohol because it doesn't fall into, you know, you know what I mean? So, man, a lot just went through my mind. Tom brought up earlier that, you know, he came across this article and he was saying, oh, maybe we'll talk about this. And at the time I was like, God, I don't know what I'd say about that. But as you just said all that out loud, I had like a waterfall in my head of ideas go. I think maybe a lot of it has to do with culture. And the the article, I didn't read the article. So I'll kind of have to use you as my baseline. But let's start with this point that maybe I have where you just brought up people are getting more, Gen Z is getting more into health and fitness. Is that what you just said? Yeah. So if you look at social media, because even I've noticed this, like for instance, being at the gym, for instance, I'm noticing way more younger and younger kids showing up to the gym and their their generation, as far as the people that work out and their quote unquote gym rats, their knowledge is way beyond what mine was when I was their age because I had to rely on like fitness magazines and stuff like that. So I think while we very often bash social media for all the negatives on the younger culture, there are some positives coming out of it. Like I, there are, a, I'm seeing a lot more little clicks of kids in the gym. I say kids. You know, back then when I was their age, I thought it was all grown up, but, you know, 16, 17 year olds. And rather than having keg parties in the woods like we were, they're having squat parties at the gym. Like, it's really cool to watch, man. So I've been working out with uh, without my headphones on Mm -hmm. a lot lately because I noticed when I took them out, I started talking to people more. You know, more people found me more approachable because I don't have headphones in. So people say hi. The first time, and then next time you see him, it's a little more than a high. But I've gotten to know, and I've actually, in many situations, like a, the, the gym gets crowded around 5, 6 o'clock when I can go, when the kids' club's open for my little one. And I'll share a, a bench with, with some of these younger guys and ladies, too, because um, usually they're in a group. Of, we're all waiting on the same thing. Oh, let's work in together. I've gotten to know a lot of these younger kids. So that's... Maybe some of them are gravitating towards that. I want to touch on my other thought on the other side of that, though, too. I've also noticed culturally, and I don't know if the article talks about this, if it's talking about just alcohol sales being down 20%, so to speak, then that's the big context there. Well, it's not It's not alcohol sales are down. It's that Gen Z is drinking 20% less. Consumption. Than millennials and millennials, we're millennials. We drank less than the generation before, so on and so forth. I'm also noticing, though, more Gen Z. Don't get me wrong. We had this in my day, too. And Woodstock had it in the 60s with LSD. We had mine with the rave scene. I'm seeing more of a culture within the, the substance abuse community of they're all into... More the the newer wave hallucin- hallucinogens, mm. you know. So you, you think maybe that? they're not drinking, but they're doing something different. So, for instance, right now, just to, yeah, that was part of my thought. That, for mm-hmm. instance, ketamine, yeah, is being pushed by the medical field right now, um, big time. Ketamine's an old drug. We had it around when I was a kid, but right now it's it's being pushed on social media both for medical reasons with their you know you can get ketamine treatment now with for for psychotherapy right there's all these places and we used to use it back in the day at raves and you go into the k-hole if you took too much it's it's really hard to kind of tell where you know this article doesn't go into a lot of specifics um <clears throat> but i just find it interesting because It's one of those things that, you know, for us, we grew up around it. At least I don't know what your experience was, but at at my house, beer was always around, you know. So I grew up, and I think this is why it's more of a generational thing. Um, You know, I grew up, my dad always had beer in the fridge, you know, and his dad was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Well, here I am. I broke the cycle, right? Levi is growing up in an alcohol-free household. So he is going to grow up, hopefully, 
fingers crossed, in an environment where alcohol just isn't isn't a thing, you yeah. know. And you know, I so I don't know if this article is, you know, because uh, now that we're looking at over 20, 30, 40 year span, it's obviously trended down. Um, there's multiple factors I believe that play into it. But the interesting thing is, is that you won't find an article like this in terms of drug use, at least from my experience, you know, it seems as if drug use in particular fentanyl is on the rise, you know, so maybe kind of going to what you're saying, and I would hate for this to be the case, but what if these people that aren't drinking are using fentanyl? I was wondering the same thing. And so part of my thought going through my head, too, is we have rock as our sample size. And I've noticed lately, have you picked up on this? I'd have to go back and count. But I feel like, because I said this to myself a couple months ago, we're getting more straight alcoholics into treatment than ever before, too. Yeah. I feel like fentanyl, as far as people entering treatment, at least at rock has kind of gone down. It, it's weird because this article just brought like a lot of thought to mind for me. I'm, am I like, are less people getting help for fentanyl now because they're dying so quickly? Or like... I don't know if it's that because obviously there's, you know, yes, there are a lot of people that are dying from fentanyl overdoses. But if you look at that, subjectively in the in, in comparison to the amount of people that are actually using it you know it's probably a relatively small percentage of people that are dying but i don't, I don't know that would be interesting for me to look up yeah and the, the truth is is i don't think you know all these polls go out and they take sample sizes here and there throughout the nation and knowing the truth and putting percentages on this stuff is impossible yeah, it really is. You can't you can't measure. I don't think they'll ever know true numbers or even be able to say that they're truly even close to accurate on any of this stuff, whether people are drinking less or more, whether more people are doing fentanyl. I mean, well, I think you can I think you can pick up on trends and you can see, yeah. you know, those sorts of things. I think it would be very difficult to quantify. OK, last year there were you know, 30 million alcoholics in the country this year, there's only 28 million or whatever the case is. I don't think you could ever get to a point of being able to do that. But I do think that there are multiple factors that can play into seeing a trend. Um, you know, obviously alcohol sales being one of them. Um, you could look at the amount of alcohol related, crimes being committed that could obviously show something in terms of where things Mm -hmm. are trending but in the end this article was interesting because it you know i i like to see that you know 20 percent less in gen z are drinkers in comparison to millennials and i do think that there's something to be said about self-awareness i do want to give gen z credit because it is something that they're not stupid You know, it's not something that, um, you know, they've, they've had awareness over the time that, you know, over the 20 some years that they've been alive and they've made the conscious decision to just not partake in alcohol. And I do think that we are coming into more of a, uh, developmental era. I mean, obviously technology is always progressing and, you know, those sorts of things. And I think that Gen Z is is more on board with, with those sorts of things and understanding that alcohol isn't going to add to that. It's not going to allow me to progress anywhere in life, you know, so why even why even put it put it into my body? And, <clears throat> you know, like what you were saying with the gym stuff and having squat parties and all those sorts of things. That's cool. You know, I think that's awesome. And if people can continue to do that, we're we're in a much different place ten years from now in terms of alcohol. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to and mention, like for instance, cigarette smoking's way down. Yeah. 
but people are also vaping a lot more. So I've treatment in treatment. What back when we started in the field, everybody smoked. Every client came in with cigarettes. Remember that? And that was one of the big rebuttals we had to have. Oh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to detox unless I have a carton of, of cigarettes. And you know, a lot of those detoxes back then would have like community cigarettes, so to speak. But I don't get that question anymore. Everybody vapes. Yeah. You know, so so culturally things have changed. I I will say, you know, I'm I'm with you, man. Maybe they do deserve some credit. Maybe they're getting smarter. I think so. Uh another interesting part in this article, it says that uh the non-alcoholic category is expanding thanks to both higher demand and innovation within the space with volumes expected to grow by 25% between 2022 and 2026. So non-alcoholic beverages. So your no, your non-alcoholic beers, your non-alcoholic martinis, those sorts of things. Mm. That industry is booming right now. Really? Yeah, people drinking mocktails and uh, you know, those sorts of things and the whole sober curious movement. You know, there's actually bars now that have opened up that serve non-alcoholic beverages. But it's still a bar setting. You still have the bar bar top with the bar stools and the the tap NA beers and the you know all those sorts of things. And I think it's catered more towards people that you know still want to have that sort of lifestyle, but not consume the actual alcohol. And hey, listen, I'd sign. I'll sign off on that all day long. You won't catch me in that situation. You won't catch me doing that just because that's too close to home for me. Like I'm not going to go sit in a bar regardless of, you know, unless I'm going to go in there with my wife for dinner. Yeah. But I'm not going to go just stand at a bar and pretend like I'm, I mean, that's it. You're pretending that you're drinking, I guess, you know, but it's cool, I guess for, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a huge part of the draw is the atmosphere, is being around people. I think most people, I won't say all people, most people fall into alcoholism. They go to the bar and they feel some so- some sort of, you know, it's a social lubricant. They get there, they meet some people, their guards down, they're more outgoing than they would be normally. Yeah. And if people are able to do that now without alcohol... Man, more power to them in my book. Yeah. No, it's good. Well, that's all I wanted to talk about, Ben. How, how, everything good? Yeah, man. I uh, We got an email, or I got an email the other day. I don't know if you were on it, but uh, what was it? Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Pretty good email, the, huh? Yeah. The, a young lady that listens pretty often. I've got multiple emails from her before that you've been on as well. Um, saying she notices a pattern that sometimes we like oversimplify the solution to recovery. Like it's more complicated and, and people have to be allowed to feel their feelings, et cetera. And I just kind of want, I wanted to touch on it briefly and see what your thoughts on it. Like I would definitely say it's very important to be vulnerable, validate people's feelings, all that stuff. But I'm also of the camp, too, of, in a way, you do have to oversimplify and bring solutions to the table. It's a process. You can't come with the solution unless you had a problem first. Right. So recognize a problem. But but I think what if I interpreted the email correctly, kind of like saying that, in a way, maybe we breeze over people's pain. What's your thoughts about that? Well, I think that it's, you know... There's a phrase that's a simple program for complicated mm-hmm. people. Um, I'm not, I, I by no means am downplaying somebody's own experiences and what they feel and what they need to feel or what they should feel and the experiences that they should, that they should uh, have throughout the recovery process. I think, um, if I would have to read the email to yeah. see, you know, the exact context of it, but 
the reason that we, I guess, simplify things is because it's not that hard. It really isn't. I mean, it's to, to a drug addict and an alcoholic that is in active addiction, getting sober is it on a surface level. It can seem impossible. Yeah. Which I'm not denying that. But when you really boil it down to, it's like me, I, I, I grew up as an auto mechanic. Mm-hmm. If you were to tell me, hey, Tom, go get that car and I need you to put it up on the lift and change the brakes on it, I'd be able to do it with my eyes closed now. But if I had never worked on a car before in my life and you told me to, hey, Tom, go put that car up on the lift and change the brakes on it, I wouldn't have a clue where to even begin. Yeah. So the point is, is that once we get to know and understand really what sobriety is all about and how to how to get there. And again, sobriety is a it's a uh, it has a different definition for everybody. You know, for me, sobriety is remaining free of any mood and mind altering substances and uh, basically being a productive member of society. No, and and let me throw this out there. Like, I I really appreciated the email and the fact that like. No, I do too. Yeah, because this is this is a re- clearly a regular listener. Yeah, and you know her saying that they were oversimplified solutions. You know, I, I, to touch on that too. Like, I guess for Tom and I, from the position that we're in, it, it really got me thinking about it. Like, does do we sound oversimplified? What can we do to? Do we need to change that? Should we change that? Um, do we need to dive a little deeper into some stuff? But I would say from from mine and Tom's positions, generally I'm looking at what do we do to get somebody from point A to point B? Because most of our listeners tend to be families who want their loved ones to get into sobriety. So they, they stumble <laughs> across one of our like YouTube videos. Uh, how It's just treatment. Don't overcomplicate it is like the name of one of them. I yeah. think or mm-hmm. something close to that. Yep. But like, what is the easiest next steps? Cause a lot of people have a tendency to, like Tom said, if you don't know what you're doing, you look at all these factors and it's hard to say, where do I start? What What's the first thing I can do? Right. And I always tell people, don't get, don't get the cart ahead of the horse. And even I will say that on a phone call, like if somebody calls me trying to get their loved one in, I'll start talking about the lower levels of care, and then I catch myself, and I'm like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Let's not get the cart ahead of the horse. Right now, all we need to focus on is getting this person into detox. Let's do that first. Um, But as part of this process, I also want to throw it out there. I brought up Tom and my perspective and position, so to speak, as interventionists and folks and guys that are, you know, having helping people mostly navigate getting to treatment getting the help that they need that's where our therapists come in yeah because uh the young lady actually sent me a a article that was it was a blog that was um about dbt dialectal dialectical behavior therapy behavioral therapy and you know kind of tying in to put some context to what she was saying but with that being said like you know, I totally 100% agreed with their email. I just like, for my position, your position, didn't want to breeze over the fact she's right. But that's the part that more of our therapists handle in this process. Yeah. You know, our therapists sit down and they go through our client's trauma. And we've touched on trauma, things like that in our podcast. Tom and I don't get too, too deep in it because the majority, at least I'll speak for myself, the majority of my experience is with the you know, on the streets, getting people in here, having those initial conversations where our therapists work the one. I let them do their, let the therapist be the therapist is kind of the way that I look at it. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't, I mean, there's so many different, you know, (laughs) there's CBT, DBT, EMDR, You know, you have all the, you know, the stages of uh, grief, you know, the stages of change, there's so many different components that go into, and that's where we have to listen, and or at least to our overall listener base. And it's like you know, I follow Dave Ramsey 
quite a bit. And Dave Ramsey is very open about how he's made millions off of common sense. Um, Now, with that being said, I don't think that sobriety is all based on common sense. There's critical Mm -hmm. thinking involved, so on and so forth. But the overall arching theme, and this is kind of where I go back to it, is relatively simple. Um, If you are able to um, build a strong sense of community with people that aren't drinking, if you're able to build some sort of um, relationship with a higher power, whatever that may be, whatever that works for you, if you're able to set boundaries, not only with yourself, but with your loved ones, if you're able to look kind of introspective and, and, and learn more about yourself and why you do the things that you do, you you could stay sober. You know, there's, a, yeah. there's, you know, and just the same as like what Dave Ramsey says, and he's broken everything down into the five baby steps or seven baby steps. First thing is you got to save a thousand bucks. Let's just start there. Let's get you to, to save a thousand dollars. Step two, we're going to get you to pay off all your debt using the debt snowball. So we're going to save $1,000 and we're going to pay off all your debt. Step three, now we're going to save a little bit of money. You don't have any debt. Let's save up three to six months worth of uh, emergency fund. Then it goes on from there. So he takes what seems to be a very complicated thing, because if I tell somebody, hey, you know, you can be a millionaire. Somebody's going to look at that on a surface level and be like, well, yeah, that's all sounds great. But how am I going to do that? But if I tell somebody, hey, you know, you could be a millionaire, it's going to take some work, but it's nothing that you can't accomplish. And let's break it down into some baby steps, so on and so forth. You're ultimately, yeah, you know, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you can definitely be a millionaire, but it definitely gets you on your way. So I think that's what we try and do is just make it more, uh, you know, palatable and not to mention, I'm not a therapist. I don't want to be a therapist. I don't find any sort of enjoyment (laughs) about being a therapist. And I've been open about that forever with any of our clients that come in here. I'm going to, just like you, Ben, I'm going to talk to you from my own perspective, my own experience, and hopefully, um, you know, our therapist can handle the rest. I like I was I was going to bring up I'm glad you segue exactly like that cuz what I was going to say is I base all this off most of it off of my own personal experience or professional experience which mm-hmm. involved my personal experience within my profession but with that being said like as an individual who's been through trauma been through a lifestyle experienced pain I am also a believer that at some point we can look at all that pain and problem but what are we going to do with it? And what I see happen, and I bring this up to our clients a lot of the times, they'll, for instance, a group, one of the ones I, I hear all the time is, oh, oh I did my, my trauma work with my therapist. Now I know why I am the way I am. Okay, you worked that part out with them. Important. Now you know why you are the way you are. Now what are you going to do with that? Because a lot of people just get stuck in the now I know why. They don't do anything to grow out of out of those behaviors that they've developed as a result of their trauma. So I'm always of the camp of like, you got you collected this info. Now, what are you doing with it? And so many people get caught in in the, the collection of information. And if we just sit in the problem forever and I'll be honest with you, I, I, I see folks a lot of times like tell me about their experience with their therapist and they've been going to therapy for years and they have all this theory on why they are the way they are, the reason that their life is falling apart. And I ask them, well, what kind of plan did your therapist give you action wise to get out of that? And they can't answer the question. Yeah. Well, Well, we just processed the way I felt about it. And I've talked about this with 12 steps before, like doing a four step, for instance, if we get stuck in the, who did it to me, how it made me feel. If we're stuck there forever, we're in trouble. So the who did it to me, what they did to me, how it made me feel, we have to do something after that. We have to follow up with some action on 
taking a look at ourselves, what behaviors of our own did we put in there? You know, that what are we going to change about our behavior? That's what it comes down to. So, again, like I understand, I, I again, I appreciate the email because it made me go back and think all this stuff through, and in no way, shape, or form do I want to dismiss anybody's pain. I just want to be, for from my perspective, I'm the kind of guy that says, okay, we know we collected all the pain info. Now let's take some action. Right, yeah, it's like telling somebody, you know, hey, you're 100 pounds overweight because you won't stop eating. Well, oh, great. You've identified why you're overweight, mm-hmm. but now what are you going to do about it, you know? Yeah. It's obviously, I don't know, maybe not a good example. Kind of no, good. It's a Or why are you diabetic? Because you won't stop eating, and you won't stop eating sugar, sugary foods, candies, cakes, pancakes, and pasta. Yeah, and this this whole thing does have to be all encompassing. It really does. For instance, we've recently had a client who, while this person did very well in therapy, gets to the end of treatment and didn't have didn't have a job, didn't have a way to move on to the next step because they didn't take finding work serious. They were like they thought in their head they were justifying the only thing I need to be doing is therapy. Come into treatment if you got to that point. If you don't hit every aspect, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like you can't reach self, what is self realization, the top of the pyramid, without first having food and shelter and all your basic needs met, security, et cetera. Like those things are important. It has to be all encompassing. So, you know, I get it. And that's what the treatment process is about. I can, I can get all the therapy in the world, but. If I'm after treatment, moving to a park bench, what good did it do me? Well, there's people that's been to treatment and gotten, you know, if you look at it, they've gotten years worth of therapy and Mm -hmm. they're still using. So, you know, what do you say to that? I guess somebody that's been to treatment three times a year for the past 10 years and treatment generally 60 days, you do that, you know, you're in treatment half the year. I, and I know that I know people that, or have are still doing this. They've been in treatment three times per year, and let's just say treatment one stay is sixty days. So therefore, you're in treatment six months out of the year. You do that for ten years. Five out of the last ten years of your life, you've been in some sto- sort of institution yeah. in terms of treatment. I'll say this too, Tom and I. Between the two of us, we've been working in this field for twenty years. 10 years each, a little more now. Yeah, more. But how many therapists have you come across that are great? And how many have you come across that are terrible? Just because somebody is a therapist and has those credentials, same thing with doctors, et cetera, doesn't mean that they're necessarily great at their job. It goes for all fields, attorneys, whatever the case is. And I've I've come across some, some therapists and in my field, and, and I would tell you right now, A, I wouldn't want my life to look anything like theirs does because they're a major mess themselves. And B, I definitely wouldn't want them giving me therapy because if they're, if they're not living that same lifestyle that they're promoting, so to speak, it goes back to that example. We use a personal trainer. I want a personal trainer who's in better shape than I am. Right? You wouldn't use me? As a personal know, Maybe for powerlifting. I'd get my powerlifting info from you. I got a belly. So generally powerlifters have bellies. Yeah. Well, that was fun, Ben. Yeah. Kind of touched on a lot of different stuff. Yeah, that's all right. It's we got just, a couple guests lined up for next week, so that'll remove some of the thinking involved. Yeah, it's just it's Friday afternoon for us and Yeah. Man, I just sometimes I enjoy just just sitting here and we didn't I don't think we necessarily had too much of a topic other than the article that you brought up. But, you know, sometimes on a Friday, man, just sitting down with Tom and having a conversation about whatever is fun. I see you keep looking at my fish. It's hard. um, It's hard not to look at the fish. You can't see it. If you're watching on YouTube, you can't see it. But when I was in the Keys, I got myself a painting of a uh, of a dolphin 
not Flipper, not the porpoise, but <laughs> Mahi Mahi. It's a nice painting, and Ben's mesmerized by it. So, so. dude, I was telling uh, one of our clients here, I won't say their name, that's here currently, and uh, I say to him, yeah, man, Tom's just getting back from the Keys. He's supposed to bring me a bag of dolphin to eat up. And he just kind of looks at me like all wide-eyed. Oh, man, I ain't never had no dolphin before. And he's thinking flipper. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I could tell what was going through his head, and I let it ride out for for yeah. a couple seconds. And I'm like, dude, it's Mahi Mahi. And like went to go show him a picture and stuff. But it was funny because he's like. Must like, he's got to be from up north. Yeah, yeah, definitely not by the ocean. Yeah. It was pretty funny, though. All right, well, that is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see you later.